This is A Momentary Taste of Being by James Tiptree, Jr. A momentary taste of being from the well amid the waste. Kayam Fitzgerald It floats there visibly engorged, blue-green against the blackness. He stares, it swells, pulsing to a terrifying dim beat, slowly extrudes a great ghostly bulge which extends, solidifies. It is a planet testicle, pushing a monster penis toward the stars. Its blood beat reverberates through weeping immensities, cold, cold. The parsec's long phallus throbs, probes blindly under intolerable pressure from within. Its tip is a huge cloudy glands lit by a spark, centaur. In grief it bulges, lengthens, seeking release, stars toll unbearable crescendo. It is a minute or two before Dr. Aaron Kay is sure that he is awake in his temporary bunk in Centaur's quarantine ward. His own throat is sobbing reflexively. His eyes are weeping, not stars. Another of the damn dreams. Aaron lies still, blinking, willing the icy grief to let go of his mind. It lets go. Aaron sits up still cold with meaningless bereavement. What the hell is it? What's tearing at him? Great Pan is dead, he mutters, stumbling to the narrow wash stall. The lament that echoed round the world. He sluices his head, wishing for his own quarters in Solange. He really should work on these anxiety symptoms. Later, no time now. Physician, screw thyself, he jeers at the undistinguished, worried face in the mirror. Oh, Jesus, the time! He has overslept while they are doing God knows what to Lori. Why hasn't Kobe waked him? Because Lori is his sister, of course. Aaron should have foreseen that. He hustles out into isolation's tiny corridor. At one end is a vertex wall. Beyond it, his assistant Kobe looks up, takes off his headset. Was he listening to music, or what? No matter. Aaron glances into Ty's cubicle. Ty's face is still lax, sedated. He has been in sleep therapy since his episode a week ago. Aaron goes to the speaker grill in the vertex, draws a cup of hot brew. The liquid falls sluggishly. Isolation is at three-fourths G in the rotating ship. Where's Dr. K, my sister? They've started the interrogation, boss. I thought you needed your sleep. Kobe's doubtless meaning to be friendly, but his voice has too many sly habits. Oh, God. Aaron starts to cycle the cup out, forces himself to drink it. He has a persistent feeling that Lori's alien is now located down below his right heel. Doc. What? Bruce and Alstrom came in while you were asleep. They complained they saw a tig running around loose this morning. Aaron frowns. He hasn't been out, has he? No way. They each saw him separately. I talked them into seeing you later. Yeah, right. Aaron cycles his cup and heads back up the hall, past a door marked Interview. The next is Observation. He goes into a dim closet with view screens on two walls. The screen in front of him is already activated two-way. It shows four men seated in a small room outside Isolation's wall. The gray-haired, classic Anglo profile is Captain Yelliston, acknowledging Aaron's presence with a neutral nod. Beside him, the two scout commanders go on watching their own screen. The fourth man is young Frank Foy, Centaur's security officer. He is pursing his mouth over a wad of printout tape. Reluctantly, Aaron activates his other view screen one way, knowing he will see something unpleasant. There she is, his sister Lori, a thin, young, red-haired woman wired to a sensor bank. Her eyes have turned to him, although Aaron knows she's seeing a blank screen, hypersensitive as usual. Behind her is Solange in a decontamination unit. We will go over the questions once more, Miss K, Frank Foy says, in a preposterously impersonal tone. Dr. K, please. Lori sounds tired. Dr. K, of course. Why is young Frank so dislikable? Be fair, Aaron tells himself. It's the man's job. Necessary for the safety of the tribe. And he isn't young Frank anymore. Christ, none of us are. Twenty-six trillion miles from home. Ten years. Dr. K, you are primarily qualified as a biologist on the Gamma Scout mission. Is that right? 
Yes, but I was also qualified in astrogation. We all were. Please answer yes or no. Yes. Foy loops the printout, makes a mark. And in your capacity as biologist, you investigated the planetary surface both from orbit and on the ground from the landing site. Yes. In your judgment, is the planet suitable for human colonization? Yes. Did you observe anything harmful to human health or well-being? No. No, it's ideal. I told you. Foy coughs reprovingly. Aaron frowns too. Lori doesn't usually call things ideal. Nothing potentially capable of harming human beings. No. Wait. Even water is potentially capable of harming people, you know. Foy's mouth tightens. Very well. I rephrase. Did you observe any life forms that attacked or harmed humans? No. But, Foy pounces, when Lieutenant Tig approached the specimen you brought back, he was harmed, was he not? No, I don't believe it harmed him. As a biologist, you consider Lieutenant Tig's condition unimpaired? No, I mean, yes. He was impaired to begin with, poor man. In view of the fact that Lieutenant Tig has been hospitalized since his approach to this alien, do you still maintain it did not harm him? Yes, it did not. Your grammar sort of confuses me. Please, may we move the sensor cuff to my other arm? I'm getting a little capillary breakage. She looks up at the blank screen, hiding the command staff. Foy starts to object, but Captain Yelliston clears his throat warningly, nods. When Solange unhooks the big cuff, Lori stands up and stretches her slim, almost breastless body. With that pleasant snub-nosed face, she could pass for a boy. Aaron watches her as he has all his life, with a peculiar mixture of love and dread. That body, he knows, strikes most men as sexless, an impression confirmed by her task-oriented manner. Centaur's selection board must have been composed of such men, one of the mission criteria was low sex drive. Aaron sighs, watching Solange reattach the cuff. The board had been perfectly right, of course. As far as Lori herself was concerned, she would have been happy in a nunnery. Aaron wishes she was in one. Not here. Foy coughs primly into the microphone. I will repeat, Dr. K. Do you consider the effect of the alien specimen on Lieutenant Tig was injurious to his health? No, says Lori patiently. It's a disgusting scene, Aaron thinks. The helpless, wired-up woman, the hidden probing men, psychic rape. Do them justice. Only Foy seems to be enjoying it. On the planet's surface, did Commander Ku have contact with these life forms? Yes. And was he affected similarly to Lieutenant Tig? No, I mean, yes. The contact wasn't injurious to him either. I repeat, was Commander Ku or his men harmed in any way by the life forms on that planet? No. I repeat, were Commander Ku or his men harmed in any way by the life forms on that planet? No. Lori shakes her head at the blank screen. You state that the scout ship's computer ceased to record input from the sensors and cameras after the first day on the surface. Did you destroy those records? No. Was the computer tampered with by you or anyone? No. I told you, we thought it was recording. No one knew the dump cycle had cut in. We lost all that data. Dr. K, I repeat... Did you dump those records? No. Dr. K, I will go back once more. When you returned alone, navigating Commander Ku's scout ship, you stated that Commander Ku and his crew had remained on the planet because they desired to begin colonization. You stated that the planet was, I quote, a paradise and that nothing on it was harmful to man. Despite the totally inadequate record of surface conditions, you claim that Commander Ku recommends that we immediately send the green signal to Earth to begin full-scale emigration. And yet, 
when Lieutenant Tig opened the port to the alien specimen in your ship, he suffered a critical collapse. Dr. K, I put it to you that what really happened on that planet was that Commander Ku and his crew were injured or taken captive by beings on that planet, and you are concealing this fact. Lori has been shaking her short red hair vigorously during the speech. No, they weren't injured or taken captive. That's silly. I tell you, they wanted to stay. I volunteered to take the message back. I was the logical choice. I mean, I was non-Chinese, you know. Please answer yes or no, Dr. K. Did Commander Ku or any of his people suffer a shock similar to Lieutenant Tyg? No. Foy is frowning at his tapes making tick marks. Aaron's liver has been getting chilly. He doesn't need wiring to detect the extra sincerity in Lori's voice. I repeat, Dr. K, did... But Captain Yelliston stirs authoritatively behind him. Thank you, Lieutenant Foy. Foy's mouth closes. On the blind side of the screen, Lori says gamely, I'm not really tired, sir. Nevertheless, I think we will complete this later. Yelliston says in his good gray voice. He catches Aaron's eye, and they all sit silent while Solange releases Lori from the cuff and body wires. Through Solange's visor, Aaron can see her lovely, French-Arab face projecting worried compassion. Empathy is Solange's specialty. A wire slips and Aaron sees her lips go, Ooh. He smiles, feels briefly better. As the women leave, the two scout commanders and the other cubicle stand up and stretch. Both brown-haired, blue-eyed, muscular ectomesomorphs, so much alike to Aaron's eye. Although Timofave Braun was born in Omsk and Don Purcell in Ohio. Ten years ago, those faces had held only simple dedication to the goal of getting to a supremely difficult place in one piece. The failures of their respective scout missions have brought them back to centaur lined and dulled. But in the last twenty days since Lori's return, something has awakened in their eyes. Aaron isn't too eager to know its name. "'Report, please, Lieutenant Foy,' says Yelliston, his glance making it clear that Aaron is to be included. The official recorder is still on. Francis Xavier Foy sucks air through his teeth importantly. This is his second big interrogation on their entire ten-year voyage. "'Sir, I must regretfully report that the protocol shows persistent, ah, uh, anomalous responses.' First, the subject shows a markedly elevated and labile emotionality. He glances irritatedly at Aaron, to whom this is no news. The level of effect is, uh, suggestive. More specifically, on the question of injury to Commander Ku, Dr. K, Dr. Lori K, that is, the physiological reactions contraindicate her verbal responses. That is, they are not characteristic of her baseline truth type. He shuffles his printouts, not looking at Aaron. Lieutenant Foy, are you trying to tell us that in your professional judgment, Dr. K is lying about what happened to the Gamma Scout crew? Frank Foy wriggles, reshuffling tapes. Sir, I can only repeat that there are contraindications. Areas of unclarity. In particular, these three responses, sir, if you would care to compare these peaks I have marked... Yelliston looks at him thoughtfully, not taking the tapes. Sir, if we could reconsider the decision not to employ a chemical supplementation, Foy says desperately. He means SCOP and EDC. Aaron knows Yelliston won't do this. He supposes he is grateful. Yelliston doesn't bother answering. Leaving aside the question of injury to Commander Ku, Frank, what about Dr. K's responses on the general habitability of the planet? Again, there are anomalies in Dr. K's responses. Foy visibly disapproves of any suspicions being left aside. What type of anomalies? Abnormal arousal, sir. Surges of, uh, emotionality. Taken together with terms like paradise and ideal and so on in the verbal protocol, the indications are, in your professional judgment, Lieutenant Foy, do you conclude that Dr. K is or is not lying when she says the planet is habitable? Sir, the problem is variability in a pinpoint sense. 
What you have suggests the classic pattern of a covert area. Yelliston ponders. Behind him, the two scout commanders watch impassively. Lieutenant Foy. If Dr. K does in fact believe the planet to be eminently suitable for colonization, can you say that her emotion could be accounted for by extreme elation and excitement at the successful outcome of our long and difficult mission? Foy stares at him, mouth slightly open. Elation, extreme, I see what you mean, sir. I hadn't... Yes, sir, I suppose that could be one interpretation. Then do I correctly summarize your findings at this stage by saying that while Dr. K's account of the events concerning Commander Ku remains unclear, you see no specific counterindication of her statement that the planet is habitable? I, yes, sir, although... Thank you, Lieutenant Foy. We will resume tomorrow. The two scout commanders glance at each other. They are solidly united against Foy, Aaron sees like two combat captains waiting for an unruly pacifist to be disposed of so that the contest can start. Aaron sympathizes. He can't make himself like Foy. But he didn't like that tone in Lori's voice, either. Man, the samples, the sensor records, Don Purcell says abruptly. They don't lie. Even if they only got 30 hours on planet, that place is perfect. Tim Braun grins, nods at Aaron. Yelliston smiles remotely his eyes reminding them of the official recorder. For the thousandth time, Aaron is touched by the calm command presence of the man. Old Yellowstone. The sod whatever it is that has held them together, stuffed in this tin can all through the years. Where the hell did they find him? A New Zealander, educated at some extinct British school. Chief of the Jupiter mission, etc., etc. Last of the dinosaurs. But now he notices an oddity. Yelliston, who has absolutely no nervous mannerisms, is massaging the knuckles of one hand. Is it indecision over Lori's answers? Or is it the spark that's sizzling behind the two scout commander's eyes? The planet. The planet. A golden jackpot rushes uncontrollably up through some pipe in Aaron's midbrain. Is it really there at last? After all the grueling years... After Dawn, and then Tim, came back reporting nothing but gas and rocks around the first two Centaurus suns, is it possible our last chance has won? If Lori is to be believed, cause people are at that moment walking in Earth's new Eden that we need so desperately. Well, we hang here in darkness, two long years away. If Lori is to be believed, Aaron realizes Captain Yelliston is speaking to him. You judge her to be medically fit, Dr. K? Yes, sir. We've run the full program of tests designed for possible alien contact, plus the standard biomonitor spectrum. As of last night, I haven't checked the last six hours, and apart from weight loss and the ulcerative lesions in the duodenum which she suffered from when she got back to Centaur, Dr. Lori K shows no significant change from her baseline norms when she departed two years ago. Those ulcers, Doctor. Am I correct that you feel they can be fully accounted for by the strain of her solitary voyage back to this ship? Yes, sir, I certainly do. Aaron has no reservations here. Almost a year alone, navigating for a moving point in space? My God, how did you do it, he thinks again. My little sister. She isn't human. And that alien thing on board, right behind her? For an instant, Aaron can feel its location down below the left wall. He glances at the recorder, suppressing the impulse to ask the others if they feel it too. Tomorrow is the final day of the 21-day quarantine period, Yelliston is saying. An arbitrary interval, to be sure. You will continue the medical watch on Dr. Lori K until the final debriefing session at 0900 tomorrow. Aaron nods. If there are still no adverse indications... The quarantine will terminate at noon. As soon as feasible thereafter, we should proceed to examine the specimen now sealed in Scout Ship Gamma. Say, the following day. Will this give you sufficient time to coordinate your resources with the xenobiology staff and be prepared to assist us, Dr. K? Yes, sir. Yelliston voice signs the log entry, clicks the recorder off. Are you going to wait to signal home until after we look at that specimen? Don asks him. 
Certainly. They go out, then, four men moving carefully in cramped quarters. Roomier than they'd have on Earth now. Aaron sees Foy manage to get in Yelliston's way, feels a twinge of sympathy for the authority cathected wretch. Anything to get Daddy's attention. He, too, has been moved by Yelliston's good wise father projection. Are his own responses more mature? The hell with it, he decides. After ten years, self-analysis becomes ritual. When he emerges into isolation corridor, Lori has vanished into her cubicle, and Solange is nowhere in sight. He nods at Kobe through the vertex and punches the food dispenser chute. His server arrives on a puff of kitchen-scented air, protein loaf, with an unexpected garnish. The commissary staff seems to be in good form. He munches, absently eyeing the 3D shot of Earth mounted above his desk in the office beyond the wall. That photo hangs all over the ship, a beautifully clear image from the early clean air days. What are they eating there now, each other? But the thought has lost its impact after a decade away. Like everyone else on Centaur, Aaron has no close ties left behind. Twenty billion humans swarming on that globe when they went. Doubtless thirty by now, even with the famines. Waiting to explode to the stars now that the technology is, precariously, here. Waiting for the green light from Centaur. Not literally green, of course, Aaron thinks. Just one of the three simple codes they can send at this range. For ten long years they have been sending yellow. Exploration continues. And until twenty days ago they were facing the bleak red. No planet found, returning to base. But now, Lori's planet. Aaron shakes his head, nibbling a slice of real egg, thinking of the green signal starting on its four-year trajectory back to Earth. Planet found, launch emigration fleets, coordinates such and such. Earth's teeming billions all pressing for the handful of places and those improbable transport cans. Aaron frowns at himself. He rejects the teeming billions concept. Doggedly, he thinks of them as people, no matter how many. Individual humans, each with a face, a name, a unique personality, and a meaningful fate. He invokes now his personal ritual, his defense against mass think, which is simply the recalling of people he has known. An invisible army streams through his mind as he chews. People. From each he has learned. What? Something, large or small. An existence. The face of Thomas Brown glances coldly from memory. Brown was the sad murderer who was his first psychosurgery patient a zillion years ago at Houston Enclave. Had he helped Brown? Probably not, but Aaron will be damned if he will forget the man. The living man, not a statistic. His thoughts veer to the reality of his present shipmates, the sixty chosen souls. Cream of Earth, he thinks, only half in sarcasm. He is proud of them. Their endurance, their resourcefulness, their effortful sanity. He thinks it not impossible that Earth's sanest children are in this frail bubble of air and warmth, twenty-six million million miles away. He cycles his server, pulls himself together. He has eighteen hours of biomonitor chapes to check against the baseline medical norms of Tig, Lori, and himself. And first he must talk to the two people who thought they saw Tig. As he gets up, the image of Earth catches his eye again, their lonely, vulnerable jewel hanging there in blackness. Suddenly, last night's dream jumps back. He sees the monster penis groping toward the stars with centaur at its tip, pulsing with pressure, barely able to wait for the trigger that will release the human deluge. He swats his forehead. The hallucination snaps out. Angry with himself, he plods back to the observation cubby. The image of Bruce Jang is waiting on the screen, his compatriot, the young Chinese-American engineer on a ship, where everyone is a token something. Only not young anymore, Aaron admonishes himself. They have me in the coop, Bruce. I'm told you saw Tig. Where and when? Bruce considers. Two years ago, Bruce had still looked like Super Squirrel, all fast reflexes, buck teeth, and mocking see-it-all eyes. Caltech's answer to the universe. He came by my quarters about 0700. I was cleaning up. The door was open. I saw him looking in at me. Sort of, you know, funny. Bruce shrugs, a joyless parody of his old jive manner. Funny? 
You mean his expression? Or was there anything peculiar about him? I mean, visually different. A complex pause. Now that you mention it, yes, his refraction index was a shade off. Aaron puzzles, finally gets it. Do you mean Tig appeared somewhat blurred or translucent? Yeah, both, Bruce says tightly. But it was him. Bruce, Tig never left isolation. We've checked his tapes. A very complex pause. Aaron winces, remembering the shadow waiting to enshroud Bruce. The near suicide had been horrible. I see, Bruce says too casually. Where do I turn myself in? You don't. Somebody else saw Tig, too. I'm checking them out next. Somebody else? The fast brain snaps. The shadow is gone. Once is accident, twice is coincidence. Bruce grins, ghost of Super Squirrel. Three times is enemy action. Check around for me, will you, Bruce? I'm stuck here. Aaron doesn't believe in enemy action, but he believes in helping Bruce Jang. Right. Not exactly my game, of course, but right. He goes out. The man without a country. Over the years, Bruce had attached himself to the Chinese scout team, and in particular to Mei Lin, their ecologist. He had confidently expected to be one of the two non-nationals Commander Ka would, by agreement, take on the planet-seeking mission. It had nearly been a mortal blow when Ku, being more deeply Chinese, had chosen Lori and the Aussie mineralogist. The second Tig seer is now coming on Aaron's screen. Alstrom, their tall, blonde, more or less human computer chief. Before Aaron can greet her, she says resentfully, It is not right you should let him out. Where did you see him, Chief Alstrom? In my number five unit. Did you speak to him? Did he touch anything? Nah, he went. But he was there. He should not be. Tell me, please, did he look different in any way? Different, yeah, the tall woman says scornfully. He has half no head. I mean, outside of his injury, says Aaron, carefully recalling that Alstrom's humor had once struck him as hearty. Nah. Chief Alstrom, Lieutenant Tig was never out of this isolation ward. We verified his heart rate and respiration record. He was here the entire time. You let him out. No, we did not. He was here. Nah. Aaron argues, expecting Alstrom's customary punchline, Okay, I am stubborn Swede. You show me. Her stubbornness is a centaur legend. During acceleration, she had saved the mission by refusing to believe her own commuter's ranging data until the whole sensors were rechecked for crystallization. But now she suddenly stands up, as if gazing into a cold wind, and says bleakly, I could wish to go home. I am tired of this machine. This is so unusual that Aaron can find nothing useful to say before she strides out. He worries briefly. If Alstrom needs help, he is going to have a job reaching that closed crag of a mind. But he is all the same relieved. Both the people who saw Tig seem to have been under some personal stress. Hallucinating Tig, he thinks, that's logical. Tig stands for disaster. Appropriate anxiety symbol. Surprising more people haven't cathected on him. Again, he feels pride in Centaur's people. So steady after ten years' deprivation of Earth. Ten years of cramped living, with death lying a skin of metal away. And now something more, that spark of alien life, sealed in China Flower's hold, tethered out there. Lori's alien. It is now hanging, he feels, directly under the rear of his chair. Two more people waiting to see you, boss, says Kobe's voice on the intercom. This is mildly unusual. Centaur is a healthy ship. The Peruvian oceanographer comes in, shamefacedly confessing to insomnia. He is religiously opposed to drugs, but Aaron persuades him to try an alpha regulator. Next is Kawabata, the hydroponics chief. He is bothered by leg spasms. Aaron prescribes quinine, and Kawabata pauses to chat enthusiastically about the state of the embryo cultures he has been testing. 
90% viability after 10-year cryostasis, he grins. We are ready for that planet. Uh, by the way, Doctor, is Lieutenant Tig recovering so well? I see you are allowing him freedom. Aaron is too startled to do more than mumble. The farm chief cuts him off with an encomium on chickens, an animal Aaron loathes, and departs. Shaken, Aaron goes to look at Tig. The sensor lights outside his door indicate all pickups functioning. The pulse regular, EEG normal if a trifle flat. He watches the alpha scope break into a weak REM, resume again. The printouts themselves are outside. Aaron opens the door. Tig is lying on his side, showing his poignant Nordic profile, deep in drugged sleep. He doesn't look over twenty. Rose petal flush on the high cheekbones, a pale gold cowlick falling over his closed eyes. The prototype beautiful boy who lives forever with his white aviator's silk blowing in the wind of morning. As Aaron watches, Tig stirs, flings up an arm with the IV tape to it, and shows his whole face, the long blonde lashes still on his cheek. It is now visible that Tig is a thirty-year-old boy with an obscene dent where his left parietal arch should be. Three years back, Tiger Tig had been their first, and so far only, serious casualty. A stupid accident. He had returned safely from a difficult EVA and nearly been beheaded by a loose oxy tank while unsuiting in the freefall shaft. As if sensing Aaron's presence, Tig smiles heartbreakingly, his long lips still promising joy. The undamaged Tig had been the focus of several homosexual friendships, a development provided for in Centaur's program. Like so much else that has brought us through sane, Aaron reflects ruefully. He had never been one of Tig's lovers, too conscious of his own graceless, utilitarian body. Safer for him, the impersonal receptivity of Solange, which was undoubtedly also in the program, Aaron thinks. Everything but Lori. Tig's mouth is working, trying to say something in his sleep. Who, huh? The speech circuits hunt across the wastelands of his ruined lobe. Ha, ha, home. His lashes lift. The sky blue eyes find Aaron. It's all right, Tiger. Aaron lies, touches him comfortingly. Tiger makes saliva noises and fades back into sleep. His elegant gymnast's body turning a slow arabesque in the low G. Aaron checks the catheters and goes. The closed door opposite is Lori's. Aaron gives it a brotherly thump and looks in, conscious of the ceiling scanner. Lori is on the bunk, reading. A nice, normal scene. Tomorrow at 0900, he tells her. The wrap-up. You okay? You should know. She grimaces cheerfully at the biomonitor pickups. Aaron squints at her, unable to imagine how he can voice some cosmic, Lifelong suspicion with that scanner overhead. He goes out to talk to Kobe. Is there any conceivable chance that Tiger could have got to where an intercom screen could have picked him up? Absolute negative. See for yourself, Kobe says, loading tape spools into the isolation pass-through. His eyes flick up at Aaron. I didn't bugger him. Did I say that? Aaron snaps. But he's guilty. They both know it because it was Kobe who was Frank Foy's other important case, five years back. Aaron had caught his fellow doctor making and dealing dream drugs. Aaron sighs. A miserable business. There had been no question of punishing Kobe, or anyone else on Centaur, for that matter. No one could be spared. And Kobe is their top pathologist. If and when they get back to Earth, he will face who knows what. Meanwhile, he has simply gone on with his job, it was then he had started calling Aaron Boss. Now Aaron sees a new animation flickering behind Kobe's clever ape face. Of course. The planet. Never to go back. Good, Aaron thinks. He likes Kobe. He relishes the unquenchable primate ingenuity of the man. Kobe is telling him that the drive chief Gomulka has come in with a broken knuckle, refusing to see Aaron. Kobe pauses waiting for Aaron to get the implication. Aaron gets it unhappily. A physical fight, the first in years. Who did he hit? Uh, one of the Ruskies, if I had to guess. 
Aaron nods wearily, pulling in the tapes he has to check. Where's Solange? Over with Xenobiology. Checking out what you'll need to analyze that thing. Oh, by the way, boss. Kobe gestures at the service roster pinned on their wall. You missed your turn on the shit detail. Last night was common areas. I got Nan to swap you for a kitchen shift next week. Maybe you can talk Berryman into giving us some real coffee. Aaron grunts and takes the tapes back to interview to start the comparator runs. It is a struggle to keep awake while the spools speed through the discrepancy analyzer, eliciting no reaction. His own and Lori's are all nominal, 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 all variation within normative limits. Aaron goes out to the food dispenser, hoping that Solange will show. She doesn't. Reluctantly, he returns to run tags. Here, finally, the discrepancy indicator stirs. After two hours of input, the analyzer has summed a deviation bordering on significance. It hovers there as Aaron continues the run. Aaron is not surprised. It's the same set of deviations Tig has shown all week since its problematic contact with the alien. A slight, progressive flattening of vital function, most marked in the EEG. Always a little less theta. Assuming theta correlates with memory, Tig is losing capacity to learn. Aren't we all, Aaron thinks, wondering again what actually happened in Gamma Corridor. The scout ship China Flower had been berthed there with the port sealed, attended by a single guard. Boring duty after two weeks of nothing. The guard had been down by the stern end having a cup of brew. When he turned around, Tig was lying on the deck up by the scout's cargo hatch, and the port was open. Tig must have come out of the access ramp right by the port. He had been EVA team leader before his accident. It was a natural place for him to wander to. Had he been opening or closing the lock when he collapsed? Had he gone inside and looked at the alien? Had the thing given him some sort of shock? Nobody can know. Aaron tells himself that in all likelihood, Tig had simply suffered a spontaneous cerebral seizure as he approached the lock. He hopes so. Whatever happened, Yelliston ordered the scout ship to be undocked and detached from Centaur on a tether, and Tig's level of vitality is on the downward trend day after day. Unorthodox, unless there is unregistered mid-brain deterioration. Aaron can think of nothing to do about it. Maybe better so. Bone-weary now, he packs up and forces himself to go attend to Tig's necessities. Better say goodnight to Lori, too. She is still curled on her bunk like a kid, deep in a book. Centaur has real books in addition to the standard microfiches, an amenity. Finding some good stuff? She looks up, brightly fondly. The scanner will show that wholesome sisterly grin. Listen to this, Arn. She starts reading something convoluted. Aaron's ears adjust only in time to catch the last of it. Grow upward, working out the beast, and let the ape and tiger die. It's very old, Arn. Tennyson. Her smile is private. Aaron nods warily, acknowledging the earnest Victorian. He has had enough tiger and ape, and he will not get drawn into another dialogue with Lori, not with that scanner going. Don't stay up all night. Oh, this rests me, she tells him happily. It's an escape into truth. I used to read and read on the way back. Aaron flinches at the thought of that solitary trip. Dear Lori, little madwoman. Night. Good night, dear Arn. He gets himself into his bunk, grumbling old curses at Centaur's selection board. Pedestrian clots, no intuition. Lori, the non-sex object, sure. Barring the fact that Lori's prepubescent body is capable of unhinging the occasional male with the notion that she contains some kind of latent sexual lightning, some secret super-sensuality lurking like hot lava in the marrow of her narrow bones. In their years on Earth, Aaron had watched a series of such idiots breaking their balls in the attempt to penetrate Lori's mythical marrow. Luckily, none on Centaur, so far. But that wasn't the main item the selection board missed. Aaron sighs, lying in the dark. He knows the secret lightning in Lori's bones. Not sex, would that it were. Her implacable innocence. What was the old phrase? A fanatic heart. A too clear vision of good. A too sure hatred of evil. No love lost in between. Not much use for living people. 
Aaron sighs again, hearing the frightened condemnation in her unguarded voice. Has she changed? Probably not. Probably doesn't matter, he tells himself. How could it matter that chance has put Lori's head between us and whatever's on that planet? It's all a technical problem, air and water and bugs and so on. Effortfully, he pushes the thoughts away. I've been cooped up here twenty days with her and Tig, he tells himself. I'm getting deprivation fantasies. As sleep claims him, his last thought is of Captain Yelliston. The old man must be getting low on his supplies. <laughs>